Good morning, everyone. Um, I think we should start this morning's proceedings. Uh, my name is John Pigott. I'm the director of the ARC Center of Excellence in Population Aging Research, CPA, and I'm also a professor of economics at the University of New South Wales in the School of Business. And these are the two organizations which are hosting this morning's event. Before we begin the proceedings, I'd like to show my respect and acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which this meeting takes place and to elders past and present and extend that respect to other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who might be present here today. I'm joining you today from Gadigal land. I invite you to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land where you're joining. Uh, for example, you could share that in the chat. It's my great pleasure to welcome such a distinguished group, representatives from academe, government, industry, and the community from around the world America, Africa, Asia, Europe, Oceania, all these areas are represented um, in the group that's meeting today. And I'd especially like to welcome today's speakers, panelists, and chairs. So as I mentioned at the outset, uh, this forum is jointly hosted by CPAR and the UNSW Business School. I'll just give you a little bit of background. Um, CPAR is a national research center. It's funded by the Australian Research Council under the Center of Excellence Scheme. It was the first social science center that was funded under the scheme. Traditionally, these very large grants were given to engineering and to science. And it's also the first that has come out of a business school. It's multidisciplinary. It's got actuaries and demographers and economists and psychologists uh, all combining uh, really to, <clears throat> to help us understand some of the implications and provide some solutions to some of the challenges presented by population aging through the 21st century. It's based here at UNSW at the University of New South Wales, but there are nodes at the Australian National University, at Curtin University in Western Australia, at the University of Melbourne and the University of Sydney. The UNSW Business School is at the University of New South Wales and it's um, one of the best business schools in the country and ranks highly worldwide. So this forum, um, ESG, so it's receiving increasing attention and we thought it would be useful to bring together some disparate perspectives on ESG. So we have economists and uh, we have institutional experts um, and we have also in the panel some people who are dealing with ESG on a day-to-day -day basis, either from a regulatory point of view um, or from a response point of view, managers of responsible investments in pension funds. And we're hoping that this great range of perspectives will generate some synthesis and so that everyone has something to take away uh, from the morning's, uh, from the morning's um, deliberations. Um, so what we're hoping is that we'll make some connections and uh, aim to advance thinking, I guess, in debate on how to implement ESG more effectively into the future. Now I'd like to introduce the chairs of today's sessions and in turn, they will introduce the speakers. So um, the, first, um, the first session will have three presentations. Uh, from academic and institutional experts. It's chaired by Professor Hazel Bateman. Um, and uh, then there will be a panel discussion uh, with practice professionals, and that's going to be chaired by Mark DeCure. So Hazel is professor in the School of Risk and Actuarial Studies at UNSW Business School. She's a chief investigator with CPAR and also a deputy director. And she has expertise in pension economics, behavioral and retirement insurance, and life cycle finance. Uh, Mark DeCure um, is, uh, has had a very distinguished um, business career and is currently uh, an adjunct professor in the business school and also very importantly, chair of the CPAR uh, advisory board. He's been an immense support to CPAR since its inception. So now it's my great pleasure uh, to welcome both Mark and Hazel. Um, they're going to be assisted today by uh, Dan Dan Yu and Sophie Yan. So um, thank you to those two individuals for their participation 
And now I'm going to hand over to Hazel uh, to chair session one. Thank you very much. Okay, hey, thank you very much, John. And um, it's, it's a delight to chair a session of three esteemed economists. So um, each, each of our uh, presenters will present for around 20 minutes. And then after that, we'll have about 25 minutes for question, answers and discussion. Um, and at that stage, I'd like to invite you to either put questions in the chat or use the hands up function. We've set this um, session up today as a meeting, so you'll all be able to ask your questions live rather than just put things in the chat. And I'd like to invite you to do that. So my first job now is to introduce our first speaker. And our first speaker is Professor Nicholas Barr from the London School of Economics. Um, and Nick is Professor of Public Economics at the London School of Economics and has written widely on many topics relating to the welfare state. Uh, so he's very well known for his work on pension reform. He's written on financing higher education. And today he's going to be talking about pensions and ESG. So Nick, I'd like to invite you to share your slides with us. Well, Thank good morning, you. everybody. It's a, a great pleasure to take part in this event, though it would be even better if we could all be together in person in the same room. I've written quite a lot about pensions, but less so on ESG. So my aim in this talk is not to set out details, but to to give a helicopter view. And, and, and maybe one way to think about this talk is as a way of getting the central ideas across to policymakers and fund managers who are not well versed, either not well versed in the issues or who are skeptical. Let me start with my punchline. First of all, I'm going to take it as read that clim climate science has a rock solid case uh, regarding the, the broad effects of human activity on climate, hence a rock solid case for acting now. And my second point is that fund managers at the moment typically have an objective uh, related to maximizing returns for a given degree of risk. And I'm gonna argue that that remit needs to be broadened to include uh, additional the, the additional objective of ESG compliance. I always, encourage my students to ask the so what question, which in this case is, why do we have financial markets at all? Primary purpose of financial markets is to take the savings of workers and to translate those into productive investment, where investment refers to physical capital like factories, machines and infrastructure uh, and human capital, uh, in other words, skills. And where productive relates to output growth both now and in the future. And obviously it's important that market signals should contribute to that objective. But in some areas, and ESG is very much one, markets left to themselves won't produce efficient price signals. Um, and the problem is what economists call market failures. The simple economic model assumes perfect competition, everyone's well informed, everyone acts rationally, there's no externalities, etc. And the invisible hand theorem, after Adam Smith's invisible hand of market forces, argues that in an economy with those characteristics, markets will achieve an efficient allocation. The problem is, that's not the world in which we live. There have been multiple Nobel Prizes awarded over the past 25 years for fundamental work explaining reasons why markets are not uh, efficient. Um, problems of imperfect information addressed by the literature on the economics of information, uh, non-rational behavior um, addressed by the literature on behavioral economics, um, there's search frictions, uh, there's incomplete contracts, there's distortionary taxation. So there are many reasons why markets might not be efficient. And there's a bunch of those that are um, relevant to ESG. In many ways, the big one is externalities. 
an externality arises where I do something that dumps costs on you for which I don't have to compensate you. So every time I drive my car, I cause global warming to increase for everyone. But because my effect is small, I may ignore it, but so does everyone else. And overfishing is another example. So the obvious negative externality is greenhouse gases. There are also positive externalities through innovation. So externalities are one problem. Another one is uncertainty. There's a very important distinction between risk and uncertainty. With risk, policymakers have a pretty good idea of the probability distribution of outcomes. With uncertainty, we know there's a risk, but we can't quantify it. And financial markets have problems pricing uncertainty. So it's not always easy to finance innovative research and development. Third problem, imperfect information. There's a lack of awareness of technologies and something I'll come on to. There's a lack of clarity about ESG compliance or not of different investments. Fourth, there's coordination problems. A lot of large scale things have to happen at the right time and in the right order. You can't have a fast rollout of electric vehicles until you've got the infrastructure for charging them in place. And coordination across countries is even more difficult. And finally, you've got problems of time inconsistency. Very often you can make profits now um, and ignore the effects on profits, uh, on later profits of things like climate change. And not least because of uncertainty, not all future losses are priced in. So you've got a bunch of problems, technical problems. And the question is, what should public policy responses uh, for pension funds be? If you want to get somebody to do something, there's two generic ways of doing it, regulation or incentives. And I will talk a bit about both. Regulation needs to relate both to the products that uh, pension funds hold and re there's the issue of regulation and fund managers. So on regulation, a key element is labeling and enforcement. There's four elements that are necessary. First of all, you need a definition of the multiple characteristics of ESG funds. You need technical definitions for fund managers <coughs> and regulators. And there have been various attempts to do this, but no overall agreement. And you need a less technical version so that consumers can identify ESG compliance or the lack of it. So you need agreed definitions. You need a reporting mandate. Funds have to be required to label funds in terms of those definitions uh, in the same way that credit card companies are generally required to calculate their interest in a legally determined way. Um, and the World Bank has set out a detailed best practice disclosure checklist citing the California public employees retirement system as a good example. So definition, a reporting mandate, then you need audit to make sure that what funds claim is true, that needs to be technically competent and it needs to be independent and seen to be so. And finally, you need enforcement capacity with teeth. So <clears throat> what's the purpose of this regulation? Well, to make it easy for market participation to identify greenwashing for a start. That's the, the E in ESG, particularly the use of fossil fuels. And there's an article in today's Economist, actually for you guys, tomorrow's, uh, uh, yesterday's Economist, which says, quote, drop the S and the G and shift the E from environment to emissions. If the measurement of firms' carbon footprints were standardized, they would be easier to shrink. So that makes the point that uh, this whole labeling exercise is still very controversial. Um, you also want to make it uh, easy for market participants to identify antisocial activities, the S, and 40 governance, the G. 
And you do that to create incentives for funds to be genuinely ESG. If there is, there are definitions and a labeling mandate, then it's harder for firms to get away with unsubstantiated claims. And it also makes it harder for firms to mask things by um, making uh, definitions as complex as possible. So why do we have this regulation? Two reasons. One is consumer protection. The other is strengthening ESG. Separate question is what fund managers should do once there is good labeling and enforcement in place. And as I've mentioned, the current rule defines fiduciary responsibility, mainly in terms of maximizing returns for a given degree of risk, but you also need, you, you need consideration of how to widen that mandate to take account of ESG considerations. Um, and an example of that is the, the Norway Sovereign Wealth Fund, where there is an explicit ESG element in the fund manager's remit. Further question is who should make the rules? Now that's way beyond the scope of this talk and of my skill set. Um, but ideally, any national body should be long-term and cross-party. Um, for example, the pensions group in Sweden is a standing cross-party body tasked with essentially protecting the integrity of the Swedish pension system. And it may be pie in the sky, but to the extent possible, the rules should be international. So lots to be said on regulation. A separate issue is that of incentives. The timing consistency problem arises because in the short run, carbon intensive production may be cheaper. Petrol cars today are generally cheaper than electric ones, and that creates incentives to make for firms to make profits today selling petrol cars at the expense of losses in the future. And there's an analogous issue with pensions where there is an issue about their sustainability if um, pension managers make promises now based on optimistic assumptions that may not turn out to hold in practice. Incentives are designed to help address this time inconsistency by making, I mean, the idea is you make future costs visible today and better pricing is a central element in those incentives, in particular, better pricing of carbon, which in essence is what the Economist article I mentioned was talking about. Um, I prefer carbon dividend to carbon tax. Bob Frank at um, Cornell has written an interesting book where he says, have a carbon tax, take the money and use it to finance either a universal basic income or at least use it to compensate lower earners for the, uh, the cost of the carbon tax. Now, if you've got a carbon tax, other things equal, that makes carbon intensive industries less profitable. If firms do nothing, they become less profitable, their share price goes down, hence their value in pension portfolios and fund managers vote with their feet. So the incentive leads firms to adopt less carbon intensive methods. When Britain introduced a sugar tax, it didn't bring in a lot of revenue for the government. It had the desired effect of making firms reformulate their recipes to include less sugar. And a, a proper carbon tax, for example, would knock out Chinese products that are cheap because their production and distribution ignore climate change. Um, you need not only better pricing of carbon um, at a point in time, you need better pricing of risk. In other words, pricing over a suitably long time horizon. Um, so the idea is that regulation should set things up such that the risk of not complying with ESG considerations uh, adds to pension fund liability. So you get an immediate signal um, uh, of the cost of not complying. Um, and again, a pensions example, regulation requires 
funded company pension plans to take proper account of future liabilities. So the good news is the economics of this is fairly straightforward. The bad news is the politics is horrible. The main problem is the political feasibility of a carbon tax. Now, I've talked about pensions and ESG because that's the essay question that John set for me. Um, this slide just mentions the fact that that's only part of the story. The wider ESG reform agenda includes not only clean energy, but things like improved urban development, uh, sustainable land use and food production, uh, more efficient and equitable water management, and things like that. So as well as thinking about this as a point in time, one needs to think of the whole ESG regulatory issue as something that is a continuing process over time. Um, I've mentioned that I take it as read that climate science is broadly right, but whilst nothing that we're likely to learn will invalidate that point, it doesn't mean that we know it all now. Of course, we don't, given new knowledge and given technical advance, such as the potential for cheaper large-scale carbon capture and storage or ways of sucking carbon directly out of the atmosphere. And both of those raise elements of uncertainty rather than risk over their timing, extent and cost effectiveness. So you need a process for monitoring the various measures. So refining the definitions that are used, finding new ways of enforcement, adjusting carbon pricing, etc. And that process probably requires an independent overseeing body that has got genuine enforcement teeth. Now, my title talked about economics is fairly straightforward, but, and we now get to the but. There's pushback by market actors. The statistic I always use, uh, tell people is that if their pension fund has a 1% annual management charge, then over a full career, uh, their accumulation will end up being 20% smaller just because of that 1% charge. And uh, somebody in Spain was telling me a few weeks ago that their pension company charges 1.5% which means over 30% of the workers' savings won't reach them in old age. But as I say, there's pushback from private actors. Um, another example, when Peter Diamond and I were asked to advise the government of China uh, about uh, in 2009, we made our pitch to the premier who said we could go public. Um, our recommendations were to move away from individual funded accounts because we thought that was premature. It took three days before um, financial market actors flew in from California to try to discredit our ideas. So you've got pushback by market actors and you've also got problems of government failure. Um, the time inconsistency problem affects governments too. Governments typically have done too little and too late. In addition, there's too little strategic planning, uh, which is necessary to address the collective action problem, both within a country and between countries. And third, there's inadequate stability of government policy. Um, Government-induced policy risk is a major deterrent to investment. The UK introduced subsidies for solar panels and said that they would be in place for quite a few years and then suddenly at short notice withdrew them. And that's death to long-term investment in uh, ESG by private actors. So in conclusion, where does that leave fund managers? Well, large funds can be active owners and can try to get firms to act in ESG ways. Non-profit funds can act as trustees for younger workers as well as older generations. But in all those cases, funds don't face a level playing field. 
So if I were a fund manager, and I'm not, and this may sound naive to those of you who are, I would get together with other fund managers and try to kick lumps out of government to do two things. First of all, to put in place the sorts of regulations and incentives I've been talking about, which means tightly worded agreed definitions, and we're nowhere close to that. And the other is tasking funds with ESG considerations in addition to their current obligations to firms and workers. And ideally what's needed is coordinated international action. Uh, an Australian fund manager will want to know whether funds in Japan or Korea that say they're ESG compliant really are. And as backup, large pension funds could make side agreements, a sort of club with funds in other countries. So that's it basically. Um, it's, a, as I say, a helicopter view. It's a huge agenda. Uh, there's so much to be done. Um, let me leave it there. And I look forward to um, hearing what the other speakers have to say and then to the Q&A. Thank you very much. Terrific. Thank you very much, uh, Nick. OK, now that's so if you've got questions, please keep them and um, I'll open up to questions after our third speaker. OK, so our second speaker today, and I'm saying today because we're on very uh, different time zones. So some people it's early in the morning. Uh, Nick, it's after midnight where he is. So thank you very much, Nick, for staying up. Um, our second speaker is Andre Laborde. And Andre is, um, he has held senior positions at the OECD, including special financial advisor to the, to the OECD G20 Sherpa. He has been head of the OECD Financial Affairs Division, Secretary General of IOPS, the International Organization of Pension Supervisors, Chair of INFA, the International Network of Financial Education, and also Managing Editor of JPEF, the Journal of Pension Economics and Finance. Um, he's retired from those positions, but he is still a senior advisor to many global organisations and universities. So I'd like to uh, welcome Andre to share his slides. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ezel. I'm, I'm very pleased and very honoured to be, to be here today. Thank you very much, John. Thank you very much, Ezel. That's a really a, a pleasure to, to participate to this very important meeting because I think that uh, ESG is very important and ESG linked with pension funds that's a, that's something which is quite special as I will try to, to introduce it. I will talk about some selected policy issues of course I won't be able to cover any issue, policy and regulatory issues related to ESG uh, investment by pension funds. I'm very lucky because I think that Nick provided uh, a very, very uh, good uh, uh, overall picture of the issues related to the regulations. So I will mainly focus on, on a part of the regulation affecting pension fund and the investment in ESG, which is related to the, uh, the supervision of, uh, of this investment by a pension supervisor. But I will talk about that later on. First, uh, and this has been alluded to uh, uh, by, by Nick uh, in several places, Higher policy recognition, that's obvious. Most for are now are dealing with uh, ESG uh, being international organization, uh, OECD, World Bank, IMF, but also the G20, the G7, or the, uh, the APEC. Uh, this is really a priority. It was again the case in the very recent meeting of the G20 finance minister and central bank governors in, the, in Bali, uh, which was uh, held uh, some, some days ago. Uh, clearly, uh, despite this high policy recognition, we have an issue with the definition, which is also uh, something uh, alluded in, uh, in various fora recently. We don't have really an uh, unanimous, unanimous excuse me, um, definition of ESG. This is also partly related to the fact that nowadays ESG uh, issues are closely linked to the concept of sustainability concept of quality, concept of resilience, uh, which complicate uh, some of these issues. I indicate development issues, why? Because, and that's something which is more and more discussed also nowadays. You know, the developing countries have uh, an issue with ESG. They agree, they all agree on the fact that uh, uh, we should have more ESG investment. 
But on the other side, what do they say? They say, well, okay, fine, but you know, we wish to focus first on development. Us, we need to develop our economies. And the cheapest way for the time being is still the fossil fuel. And new developed countries use that in the past. So we need to recognize this. That's very important to reach a global solution uh, at uh, the international level. And there is indeed uh, recognition by uh, more and more developed countries on this issue. And uh, they try they tried to address that, especially for instance, the G20, uh, with a special uh, fund, which, is, uh, which has been the, developed. The political issue, uh, clearly ESG is political. So let's be clear because we need to, to, to recognize this. The best example, the, the current discussion at the level of EU about the taxonomy, the fact that the parliament agreed that gas and nuclear energy have to be, for the time being, as a transitional measure, have to be considered as sustainable investment. As you can imagine, uh, a lot of people disagree on that, but still, that's a fact that's like that. Investment regulation, we have a lot of regulation on investment for the pension fund, but still not a lot related to, to ESG. Higher recognition by investors as well. Now we move to the, oh, that's nice to have, to the must have. Still, we have a lot of debate discussion about the fiduciary duties, but I will come back on that later on. And don't forget that investors basically, uh, well, the main objective is, is return based. So that's something which is uh, which has to be uh, kept uh, kept in mind. Fortunately, somehow the recent study show that basically the ESG investment are neutral or maybe positive compared to the performance in traditional area. Now, very recent studies are challenging this, which is not so good. Uh, and a study which is even not published which has been developed by EDEC Institute on infrastructure, uh, consider that up to now the ESG return were higher, but that it won't necessarily be the case in the, in the future. So that's very important to follow that. The cost issue as well, uh, Larry Fink, for instance, the CEO of BlackRock mentioned clearly, well, uh, ESG, fine, but that's costly. Are we ready to pay the price? That was his question in a recent uh, uh, meeting. And the risk, at the risk, uh, clearly, uh, we have a lot of risk. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, this table show you some risk related to infrastructure investment. Um, and you have, the, of course, the risk for the different phase, the risk for developed countries, for developing countries. And the recent study within the, the IOPS uh, seems to, con to show that the supervisors expect that the risk uh, related to ESG will go through all the traditional risks that we have. Uh, credit operation, liquidity, and, and so on. So uh, that's important to keep that in mind. Uh, and also uh, the fact that, yes, pension funds are increasingly investing uh, in, uh, in re renewable energy. Well, still, this is not the major investment, but still, we see that there is a clear trend. They do that in different way. There is a focus uh, on climate change, energy, pollution issues, but also human rights. The S is getting some momentum currently, as well as human capital and the governance issue, corporate governance, and of course, uh, business, uh, business ethic. Uh, different way to do that, as we know, active ownership, uh, exclusionary screening, this, uh, in, this investment, thematic investment, and so on. So, and that's something which was alluded also by, by Nick. Most know when you talk about ESG, that's about E for most people. But again, we have more and more consideration about the S, inclusiveness, uh, the, the children, uh, indigenous group, the gender, water, and uh, energy access, and the G, the, the governance. Big problem uh, related to the fact that we have a huge fragmentation of the methodology used to assess the uh, level of ESG investment uh, to, uh, to measure that, to rate that. And that's a very, very big issue, which is complicated by the fact that you have several stakeholders, but you have a lot of inconsistencies between the taxonomies, 
between the methodologies. Again, a very recent study by the OECD issued uh, in June clearly called for a move from the methodology which are focusing on disclosure, disclosure of existing policies in companies to what would be better, disclosure of actual alignment of these policies with uh, uh, green, uh, green, green policies with climate uh, objective. And we need an assessment, of course, to see if all that is moving in the, in the right direction. So I'm sorry to say that, but currently there is a mess, okay? Clearly, at the national and international level, uh, and something has to be uh, here to be, uh, to be changed for the regulators, for the government, for the investors who are lost when really they wish to invest uh, in ESG, especially, of course, uh, the smaller um, uh, investor. So that's really a problematic issue that we need to, uh, we need to address, as I say, taxonomy concerns. We cannot continue to have a various term used in different ways across the industry. We cannot continue to have rating score, uh, which varies so widely. Again, there was a study by the IMF showing that the, the top 10 uh, became uh, rated by by uh, rating agencies became the, the worst the worst ten uh, in, with another rating agency. So that's just you know just amazing. But that's something which needs to be to be addressed. And the policymakers are quite concerned uh, with this uh, nowadays. There were a lot of discussion also in the past uh, about uh, how to address that through the proper regulation. Regulation. Uh, they, they basically provide indeed scope for ESG integration, but they don't necessarily encourage it. And there are a lot of things which could be done with the development of new type of model, uh, regulatory one included, and to address this uh, issue that I just mentioned about the fact that integration is hampered by the lack of commonly accepted analytical methods and, and data. Uh, and also there is considerable uncertainty about the policy path. And this is the same call from the investors. When we had a big report at the, the, the OECD and analyzing the investors point of view, they, they also encourage common understanding. They encourage uh, the ability of investors to measure and to compare sustainable and energy performance. So data is really key. And one of the, the big projects which is currently developed is really to ensure availability of relevant, reliable, and transparent source of, uh, uh, of data on this instructor project. Now, let me focus on, uh, on, on IOPS. So IOPS is the International Organization of Pension Supervisors. Basically, that's the international standard setter for the supervision of pension funds. It counts supervisors from uh, more than 80 countries. And IOPS uh, decided and succeeded to release IOPS supervisory guidelines on the integration of ESG factors in the investment and risk management of pension funds in 2019. Uh, I was still the Secretary General of that organization at that time. Let me tell you, I was very surprised that we reached that agreement. Uh, I'm very familiar with development of principles, guidelines, whatever at the international level. I worked a lot uh, in that field, but, but I can tell you that to reach an agreement on this kind of guidelines uh, was, was indeed uh, surprising. And well, why? Uh, because uh, clearly, why to develop these guidelines? Because clearly there is an increase of the pension fund investment in the ESG area. I mentioned that. This is still very new. It's still dynamic, there's a lot of uncertainties. Again, we lack data for the pension fund, but also for supervisors. Supervisors, uh, they, they claim that uh, they lack regulation, they lack regulatory framework, they lack data, and they lack taxonomy. So we have this new supervisory guidelines which help. But, and that's extremely important, this, these guidelines do not intend to induce pension funds into ESG investment. Why? That's not the job 
of the supervisors of pension funds. That can be the job of government, fine. And you could consider ESG as a public good and so on. But that's not the job of the supervisors because they know that one and the main objective of the pension fund at the end of the day is what? Uh, is to provide pension. That's not necessary to develop ESG, that's to provide pension. If you can do both, all the best, but that's, that's very important to keep that in mind. And in a flexible way, flexible way, because we need to take into account national circumstances and so on, in a proportionate way also, because we have, you have big pension funds, you have very small pension funds, and you, that, you know that very well in Australia. So that's important to have this, uh, this consideration. For the guidelines, the ESG factors, which are non-financial and financial factor hybrid, they were considered as financial, uh, uh, financial factor. So uh, the guidelines, first one, supervisory authorities should require that the pension fund providing body consider, so consider ESG factors. So, and this imply what? But this imply also they understand that. And that's, uh, that's not a, a simple job. Let me, let me tell you, that's, uh, that's for sure that we need further work also related to the education of the governing board and, and more data. The guidelines number two is really very important. Supervisory authority, authorities should clarify to the pension fund what that the explicit integration of ESG factor into pension fund investment and risk management process is, is in line with their fiduciary duties. So they all agree on that. So that's in line with fiduciary duties. And you, and you know why it is so important to, to, to repeat that. So um, guideline free is about also the fact that, well, in some cases, if you know, the pension fund uh, decide to invest in a, on a, on non-financial uh, uh, factor basis, including ESG, including ethical uh, uh, also factors, you can, this can, this can um, uh, produce some, some sacrifice of a return. So the, but the, the beneficiaries have to be informed, of course, to take an informed decision as well. And the pension fund should, uh, also uh, consider ESG factor with no prejudice to the objective of gaining appropriate risk return profile on purely financial ground. Guidelines five is going further, not only to consider ESG, to integrate ESG factor into the investment strategies. But again, balance, supervisory authority should avoid being overly prescriptive on how to do that. And also, the, if the pension fund cannot do it or don't do it, okay, but then they have to explain why. And if they, they do it, they can also follow the principle of proportionality, as I said, which is related to the scale of pension fund. Uh, guidelines, uh, skip the guidelines six, guidelines seven, important that's seven, eight, and, and nine, that's really on the disclosure. So, of course, to report to the supervisory body. The supervisors should also issue, and we are working on this currently, issue regulation for pension fund on how to report to members and stakeholders. And of course, also the pension fund have to disclose in general to their members about the, uh, the, the policies related to sustainable investment. And there is a very interesting sentence after. A very interesting one. When appropriate, that's a pity that we have very appropriate. Pension funds should also regularly provide report on what? Their own engagement with investees, but as well as request companies in which they invest, and potentially they invest a lot. So to request companies in which they invest to disclose their own ESG related policies. So you see the, the potential impact uh, with this, this disclosure, not only for pension funds, the pension fund asking the companies in which they invest, uh, and they, they could, by the way, invest a lot more than they do now, uh, uh, for instance, in unlisted uh, infrastructure uh, investment. Uh, this is really I mean, ridiculous somehow compared to the amount they, they could invest. And so uh, that's a very important uh, sentence. Guidelines 10 is about something more technical. That's the, uh, the test, uh, the scenario testing which again should include also the, excuse me, uh, 
the SG factor, but of course, taking into consideration the principle of personality. So quick comments. Major trend, clearly, uh, we are all, we all agree on that. There's a, a clear trend toward more uh, ESG investment, that's for sure. But, but as I said, we have major issues, uh, major issues related to this concept of ESG, which is very political. And this time we have something very political. This creates a lot of problem and issues. We know that this is very sensitive. Uh, and I, this is also, uh, with this complex complexity brought by the fact that we have, as I said, big mess, sorry for the word, but it makes in methodologies at national, international level. So ESG, complex issue, which call for careful consideration and regulators and supervisors, they not very comfortable with ESG for all the reasons I mentioned. Urgent need for international action, which by the way, can help addressing these uh, national political issues. And also to stop this fragmentation, we need to have these inconsistencies and uh, we need better, better data to guide uh, in a better way the regulation, the policy making and the, the investment. And all that in, in, in the pension field, and we know that pension funds have very special characteristics. These investors are investing assets belonging to their beneficiaries uh, for uh, as the main part. That's, that's a very important component. And that means also the future retirement, the future pension. This has a huge social impact also. And that has to be uh, carefully taken into consideration. Um, we are working on this, by the way, at IOPS about the implementation of these guidelines. We will make a consultation uh, and we, of course, we'll consult the, the academic community, the business community. So we'll come back to, to you and I thank you in advance for your comment at the time that uh, we do uh, this, uh, this consultation. So I will stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andre. Um, and also like Nick, I'd like to thank you for talking to us at a very unfriendly time of the day. So we're now turning to our third speaker. Warwick McGibbon is um, a distinguished professor of economics and public policy and director of CARMA, the Center for Applied Macroeconomic Analysis in the Crawford School of Public Policy at ANU. Um, he's also a fellow CEPA chief investigator where he's director of policy engagement and ANU node leader. Uh, Warwick is internationally renowned for his contributions to global economic modeling. And um, just a little anecdote. So several decades ago, when I was struggling through my PhD and wondering if I would ever finish, there was a lovely article of Warwick in the Good Weekend. And he was sitting on a bench with, the, with his world economic model in his laptop. And it did sort of motivate me that doing a PhD can allow you to think about big picture things and try and solve the world's problems. Um, so it's really nice to introduce Warwick to talk about his world models this morning. Uh, so the floor is yours, Warwick. Thanks very much, yeah. Hazel. Um, that seemed like such a long time ago uh, when John Edwards interviewed me for that article. Um, this project I'll talk about is part of a broader project that we're running inside of our CPAR, which looks at the impact of population ageing uh, and its relationship with um, antimicrobial resistance, climate change and long-term economic growth. So today um, I'll follow from Nick's presentation. Uh, I'm going to take the E out of ESG and focus on emissions. And so this is talking about how we think about climate shocks, climate policies and changes in climate risk assessment. This presentation is based on joint work with Washington Fernando, uh, who's a PhD student of mine currently at the International Monetary Fund and uh, Larry Weiping Liu, who's a colleague at ANU and a CPAR uh, researcher. Uh, we wrote this first draft for Brookings in 2021. We've actually done a lot of thinking about how to do a better job than what we've done here. But the idea was to come up with a way of quantifying some of the issues related to, to climate change and climate risk. Um, so I'll very quickly go through, uh, and the previous two speakers have made it very clear why climate change is an issue. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about how we model climate risk and give you some summary of some of the results. And so um, climate change itself has a number of impacts on the macroeconomy. One is through physical climate risk, 
That is through shocks coming from the climate. The second is through transition risks for sectors and companies and households that come from various policy approaches to addressing climate change. Uh, and both of these, the physical shocks, as we're seeing with forest fires in Europe and the US and floods in Australia, have very significant macroeconomic implications, but also the policies matter. Uh, and so how you actually transition from where we are today to where we need to be according to the science requires a major structural change in the world economy. So what we're exploring in this paper is, is three things. I won't present all three today, I haven't got time, but the first is physical climate risk. And that's coming about both due to chronic climate change, that is the change in temperatures over time and how that impacts on the economic activity. And the second that we've added, which has not been looked at in the economics literature, is how to model extreme events. So it's not just the shifts in trend, but it's also the extreme shocks. This is all very preliminary. And in fact, we've come up with a different way of doing this, approaching this than what's in this paper. The second issue we want to look at is what I've already mentioned is transition risk. That is the impact of, of climate policies to get to net zero by 2050. And the third is to look at what happens if financial markets aren't pricing climate risk appropriately and all of a sudden they realise that this is a much more important issue than they thought and they change the risk premium in various financial markets. Again, this is very preliminary what we've done on this, but the numbers are significant and so it's worth encouraging a lot more research in this area. Now, before I move, I'll just mention very quickly the model that we're using. Um, the GQ model uh, is actually becoming quite widely known now. It was used recently in the network for greening the financial system scenario work, uh, the NGFS. Um, it's also being used in the IMF World Economic Outlook uh, in October 2020, looking at climate change and the global macroeconomic um, outlook. It's about to be released in a new study next week, looking at global, global balances from the International Monetary Fund. The way to think about this model is a hybrid of two different techniques. One is the dynamic stochastic general equilibrium models that we find in central banks and very large CGE models um, that people use for trade policy and, and tax, tax and uh, tariff policy. Um, the key features of this model is that it captures the linkages in production networks within countries, across countries. It has international trade, capital flows, uh, a forward-looking model of consumption and investment. It's a macroeconomic model, but a lot of the dynamics are driven at the sectoral level. So it's a way of integrating the macroeconomic linkages in the world, but from the sector upwards, individual sectors upwards. And to follow on from an, uh, the issue about do markets clear? Well, there's a lot of rigidities in this model. There's a lot of frictions in labor markets. There's frictions in capital accumulation. There's unemployment in the very long run, there's full employment, but there is a lot of rigidities in various labor markets. Uh, and we have this model of adjustment cost. It's very costly to do things quickly. So if you're going to build an entirely new capital stock, it's very expensive to do it quickly. So you have to do it and phase it in over time to minimize adjustment costs. Uh, it's a very large model. We have 20 sectors in each region, a lot of sectoral disaggregation, in particular modeling of electricity sector, energy generation technologies in different sectors in different countries. Um, it has a very clear rule for governments in terms of their fiscal policies. And there are central banks here who are, who are managing inflation output, inflation trade-offs, et cetera. And this is a global model. So the entire world is covered, but uh, many of the countries are aggregated together. But we do pull out the major climate relevant countries, the US, Japan, Europe, China, India, Russia, and then Australia, and then the rest of the advanced economies, all exporters in the rest of the world. Uh, and what's important in this uh, is, is how technology is modelled. And one of the problems we're thinking between now and 2050, let alone between now and 2100, is how do you model technology? Uh, the assumptions that are being made are highly sensitive um, to, to the results or the results are sensitive to the assumptions. So the way we do this is as economists, which is somewhat different to the way integrated assessment models work. They model particular technologies. We see technology as a transformation of capital, labor, and in materials, they're combined together to produce output in different sectors. And the capital stock is fixed in, in, a, in the current year, but you can change your inputs of labor, energy, and materials. Um, and so we don't actually talk about how you generate electricity at a coal-fired power plant in, uh, in, in Victoria. We talk about the total amount of 
electricity that's produced by coal in Australia, using combinations of different types of, of technologies in, in that sector combined through this sort of methodology. Uh, it's worth just mentioning, and this is, this is important, um, for how carbon pricing and, and changes in incentives actually filter through the economy. A lot of people think when you're changing the carbon price, all you do is changing the way in which you generate electricity or the way in which you generate energy. That's actually not the main impact of changing carbon prices. When you change the carbon price, you're changing every aspect of production across all sectors of the economy. So here's a representation of a, of a firm that's called the mining company. The output is a combination of capital, labor, energy, materials. The energy bundles that are used is a combination of different types of energy. The electricity that's used in electricity is very different types of technology. So when, and materials, which is um, you bringing in inputs from construction, mining, agriculture, et cetera. When you change the carbon price, you change the structure of the entire economy. You don't just get substitution out of fossil fuel intensive electricity into low carbon electricity. You get production networks changing. People will move completely away from fossil fuel intensive activities, whether they're energy related or not energy related. And there's a, a big impact of substitution across the economy. So the reason the carbon price is such a good idea is because it actually changes it changes every, every behavior in the economy. So the more you can spread the adjustment, the lower the costs will be uh, in, in reaching a, a particular goal. Now, what we do then in, um, in, in this particular paper and what we've done for the NGFS and for the IMF and others is you have to generate a, a projection of the world between now and 2100. Again, if you go back to 1900 and you ask, what will the world look like today? Uh, you would have probably got it wrong. So these are not forecasts, these are just trying to understand, given the information we have, what might the world look like under a very clear set of assumptions. You change those assumptions and you look at sensitivity about how uncertain the future really is. Um, we have a productivity catch up model, which I won't talk about, but countries are catching up to a frontier. Uh, and what you generate here, this is a, a, a put, um, this is from the World Economic Outlook. On the left hand side, this is what global emissions look like if we start and take the assumptions in 2018 policies, not promises, but policies that are in place, and you run the world out to 2100. This shows, tells us that emissions will rise under those policies from 35 gigatons annually to about 60 gigatons annually. So that's a very large increase in CO2 emissions. Uh, there's a lot to be done to get that to zero by 2050. You can see that a lot of the emissions are coming from China, uh, rest of the world, India, and that the advanced economies' emissions are relatively stable and in some cases falling. What's interesting in this sort of exercise, on the right-hand side, it's showing you the black spots is what happens to CO2 emissions in decadal steps over time, the growth rate. So emissions are 20% higher, but they're actually falling over time. And the reason for that is structural change in the economy. Each one of these bars is showing you the contribution to that change in CO2 emissions. So energy intensity is falling. So the amount of energy and economic activity naturally is falling in this projection because the economy itself has structural change moving from energy intensive industries to non-energy intensive industries, particularly services. Um, you see the biggest driver of emissions under the policy assumptions in place. Uh, the biggest driver is GDP per capita. The second biggest driver is population growth. And you can see that there is actually also an endogenous shift in carbon intensity because over time, electricity and other energy technologies are changing as, um, to reduce CO2 emissions uh, automatically. So this shows you that, that we have a lot to do, um, and that the world, the structural shifts in the world need to be accelerated to get down to a net zero by 2050. So let's look at the climate risk. So, um, what we, We've got physical climate risk that's coming from chronic, chronic climate change. We have the policies that are being implemented uh, to, to reduce emissions. And then we look at the change in risk premium. Now, what we do is, is we use information from the integrated assessment models, and there's a body of um, climate scenarios called representative concentration pathways. So what we do is we take those projections, the different assumptions about how concentrations evolve and therefore how temperatures evolve between now and the end of the century. We then use historical data to examine the damage function. That is, how does economic activity change in different sectors as a result of um, temperature changes? And so we have a, a limited set of data. We use the World Bank um, approach of estimating these damage functions at the sectoral level. 
We then take the, um, uh, those damage functions, we take the climate temperature projections and we feed them through to impact on economic activity, which I'll mention how we do that shortly. Um, we also, and this is new, is that we try to get the extreme events into, into the model. That is the extent of damage caused by floods, droughts, heat waves, cold waves, storms, et cetera. So we use the information about the future climate projections, feed them through these additional damage functions, which are attempting to measure extreme events. Now, what we do here is we actually take the mean, which is taking the midpoint of the estimates over time of how the damages will change. What we want to do is to actually specify different um, uh, probability distributions, different density functions, and so instead of assuming things might be normally distributed to actually look at some of the issues about what it's by, by modal distribution. So we're drawing stream events from a distribution which may have very, very fat tails. And then we would look at the entire distribution of possible outcome given the draws in the tails of the extreme events. We haven't done that in this paper. We've sort of smoothed it a bit to get some magnitude. Um, so there's, there's four scenarios which are related to temperature increases. The one we, I will focus on now is just RCP 4.5, and that is temperature increases between two to three degrees by 2100. So this is overshooting um, what the scientist is telling us we should do. So what are the damage functions? Well, we use the Vero Satori approach, and we're looking at the impact of climate change on sea level rise, how it impacts on land, heat related impacts on labor productivity in the key sectors of agriculture, manufacturing services. Um, we look at how temperature changes will impact on diseases and how diseases will impact on labor productivity. And we look at agricultural productivity of maize, rice, and wheat. Um, on the chronic shocks end, we take, so we take these historical relationships, we take the future projections, we feed them in, and then we get a path of particular of potential shocks into the future. Big problem there, of course, is that it could be highly nonlinear as we move out through time. We're assuming the historical relationship that we've estimated continues. So we're, we're, we really are underestimating at this stage what the events might look like. Um, the extreme shocks, same sort of idea, um, but we're looking here at um, agricultural yield, yields. What happens in history when there's a major climate event, uh, like a flood or, a, fa or, a, or a, um, a forest fire, how it impacts on agricultural yields, electricity generation, energy production, and we use a lot of the information from uh, this disaster database. Again, similar idea to what we do with the um, uh, other shocks. We, we're looking at extreme events here. We do the projections, we use the model. There's a lot of limitations, obviously, a lot of uncertainty. Um, we're uh, using, and for the extreme events, um, the, the duration um, of the event is we don't have any data on the intensity of the event. So when you get a data report that says there's been a forest fire, it doesn't tell you how big it is or how devastating it was. So we need a lot better data than the currently have available. Um, but we have, to, we have to do something. And so we're making these approximations. Um, so how do we do this? Well, shocks for physical climate change, they have impacts through sectoral productivity changes and they change the labor supply. And in a similar way, extreme events have shocks on sectoral productivity and changes in labor supply. So from an economic point of view, we're impacting labor supply and productivity from the climate changes. I won't go through this in detail because we don't have time, but we go down to a very great de degree of disaggregation because even though the model only has 10 regions and 20 sectors, we can actually do the calculations at a very, very disaggregated country level, very disaggregated sectoral level, and then we aggregate these up to get the shocks that we feed into the model. So the example here is how we calculate heat induced impacts on labor productivity, the impact of diseases on labor productivity, the impact of sea level rise on, on uh, agricultural productivity, et cetera. So um, that's the, the, the main climate shocks themselves. The transition risk is focusing on policies. And here we just pick one example, which is carbon tax only a carbon tax that achieves net zero by 2050. Each country implements this to achieve their own targets. Um, so carbon taxes are different across countries. It's just one assumption. There are many different scenarios you can do. I want to stress that these results are very different to what we found in the World Economic Outlook, because even though the carbon tax is the most efficient policy to reduce emissions, it also leads to a much larger economic costs than if you combined it with infrastructure programs 
subsidies through uh, offset market failures, uh, through green subsidies, et cetera. So in the WIA results, we get much less economic cost, but much more effective em emission reductions because the carbon tax is giving you the emission substitution and reduction and the infrastructure programs and the other attempts to offset market failures is actually giving you economic benefits. So you can offset the costs and the benefits using a portfolio of policies. Um, but just to give you an example, so these are the sort of car taxes, very different across countries. It's a hoteling tax. So we search for what the tax needs to be in the first year. If we let it rise by 7% per year, we achieve our target by 2050. Um, and the changing risk premia, we look at how climate events in history have moved equity risk premia in different markets and try and use that empirical relationship with the temperature uh, assumptions to get some idea of what happens if risk premia shift, um, surprisingly. I won't touch that now. Let me finish up by just by summarizing results and I'll focus on three things. The first is real GDP. This is, um, and this is, a, this is a complicated graph. Please do not add these together. We shouldn't have drawn it this way. We should have drawn them next to each other. This is just to give you an idea of scale. But what this shows you is that first panel is the average impact over a decade to 2030, the second panel over the decade to 2040, and the third panel over the decade to 2050. The physical risk shocks are causing for different countries, different amounts. For China, it's around 2.5% of GDP per year loss. Um, the transition risk just from the carbon tax is uh, order of magnitude the same, uh, but it is bigger because of the way we've done just a carbon tax. It'd be very different if we did a portfolio of, of policy. And the equity risk premium is also quite big. It's biggest for Russia. This is 5% uh, of GDP taken out of the Russian economy on average uh, over that decade. So the GDP impacts are, are quite significant from all three shocks, but it varies across countries and across time. For those that are interested in R-star, if any monetary economists here, this shows you that the shocks to the climate, either transition shocks, physical shocks, or equity shocks, move R-star around. Uh, minus one here is 100 basis points. So this says for China, real interest rates would be 100 basis points lower than otherwise would be the case uh, in this decade to 2030. Uh, you can see that these numbers are quite significant. And finally, and this is what will be in the report next week, coming from the IMF, is that what you see on the trade flows is actually quite significant. This says, for example, Japan will have a current account uh, move towards deficit of nearly 4% of GDP. Australia has a current account uh, surplus of 1.5% of GDP. What's happening here is that there's a big shift in savings and investment flows. So countries like Australia, that are very fossil fuel intensive. Investment collapses in, in the fossil fuels and it hasn't had time to expand in the renewables in that decade. So capital flows out of Australia into other countries, the exchange rate depreciates, the current account moves into surplus. This is the opposite to what many people think. Australia is a net fossil fuel exporter. So you would think if people stop buying our, our exports that we would actually run um, um, trade deficits. We lose our exports, trade deficits. However, what's happening here is that the exchange rate is moving around to balance global savings and investment and to balance uh, the adjustment within the Australian economy. So capital flows out of Australia and therefore you end up with a current account surplus. So th this is quite the opposite to what a lot of people think. Those countries that are ahead in, in renewables like uh, Europe, US and, um, and Japan will get capital flowing into their economies. They've already got some scale in their renewable energy sectors. So therefore they can actually have more investment and they can actually attract more capital from overseas. So you can see this, this, this is quite an interesting story, uh, but it's just one scenario. Uh, so to, just to summarize, um, these models, uh, we, we're learning technologies on how to, to do these sort of uh, scenario exercises to better understand sensitivities, where the key issues might be. Don't take any of this as a forecast, but it does demonstrate that under the one set of assumptions that we've, we've used, the numbers are significant. They're significant in terms of the impact of climate change. They're significant on the impact of the transformation to decarbonize the world economy. And they're significant if financial markets aren't pricing these risks appropriately. And, uh, and I'll stop there. Terrific, thank you very much, Warwick. So I would like to really thank our three speakers, uh, Nick Barr, Andre LeBall and Warwick McGibbon. It's been, uh, it's been a terrific session, great, great presentations and really good discussion. So thank you very much. And I'd like to close this session and we'll re uh, reconvene at 10.45. So thank you very much and see you soon. <laughs>
Uh, welcome back. Um, my name is uh, Mark DeCure and my, my role today is to uh, chair this second session. The, the whole point of this session is it will build, build on the last one and it, um, I think some of the good discussion we're having at the end of the last session can continue in the, the Q&A of, of this session and I think our, all our panellists will, 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 will be able to contribute to that. Um, the, the panel today is really meant to bring out these issues, I guess, from the coal face is a crude way of putting it. We've got um, Amy Oster, who is a PwC partner, with a, she'll come with a broader perspective on the issue. Uh, we've got Joanna Chang, who's the APRA Investment Risk Specialist, and she'll come from the Prudential Regulator's perspective. And we'll have uh, Lisa McDonald, who's um, Head of Responsible Investments at Aware Soup, which is a major industry fund, and she'll come from that perspective. I just thought I'd make a few um, few comments up front, and then hand over to each of the panelists to to to, to speak. This this conference is really focusing, uh, I suppose, on the link between pension funds and ESG, but it obviously is sitting within the much broader picture, which which we've just been been discussing. And um, and within this context, you've got businesses also um, concerned about this. That it's, it's not just an investor issue in business are concerned because it affects their employers, it affects their business in the future, it affects their risk profile, it affects their cost of capital. Um, so everyone has got a personal or an individual interest in this issue. And I guess there's a number of the uh, Nick Barr pointed and others that, you know, there's really just some, there's some market failures, uh, which are sort of in the past have led to a situation where it's it's it's, it's sort of not really been solved and the, 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 we have got major issues both from a climate perspective but also human rights you know destruction of you know history um abuse of people uh, there's been all sorts of issues that come under this 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 issue um and but I don't think the market failures, they need to be addressed, but I don't think they're necessarily going to uh, assist forever. And I think if you, uh, just a couple of things, I mean, Bain recently did a survey of, um, you know, CEOs opinions and um, globally, you know, 50% of CEOs see this as a priority. Um, a lot of them see it as, um, needing a major focus in both investments and in, in and its understanding in the context of risk. Um, the Lowry Institute Survey of Australian Attitudes and also the recent PwC Global Risk Survey reveals that these climate change issues and also geopolitical issues, which also come into ESG, are major issues for society it's, it's, and, and for businesses and they're seen as driving risk. They're not ignorant of this and they're starting to address it. Um, I think uh, there's there's a bit of a debate that sits there for pension funds that says, well, you know, ESG issues are not their responsibility. At the end of the day, they have to deliver the return. And again, Nick Barr talked about this and said, well, maybe it needs to be written in or maybe it doesn't because maybe risks will write it in as businesses start to realise and fund managers start to realise the inherent risks of the underlying in businesses they're investing in. Um, I think the the economist Nick referred to the Economist magazine, but they, they recently know that investors are increasingly using environmental, social, and governance metrics within their investment processes, not only to assess risk, but to identify potential real world impacts, both positive and negative, of corporate operations and future investment opportunities. Um, Tony Kane in the Australian recently wrote that um, that uh, you know ESG assets will exceed sixty trillion by twenty twenty six. And even in Australia, we've had three billion of investments in this area, in the, you know, in the last year. Um, and it's it it just doesn't necessarily, you know, boil down to a pure risk return um, discount. It's just part of balancing your long term portfolio to mitigate against what could happen as climate change unfolds. You want to be on the winners. Uh, I think, though, there is, uh, you know, there's obviously a lot of uncertainty here um, and there's a lack of information and there's a lot of greenwashing and woke capitalism going on. So I think all the previous speakers talked about the need for 
I guess, greater transparency, consistency, and understanding of the underlying risks of investments. And, you know, the, the International Accounting Standards Board in, the, in, in Australia, the Accounting Standards Board, are all working on standards to, to basically help govern what companies report in terms of their ESG practices and make those reporting consistent, comparable, and useful, and auditable. And I think that's going to be a big factor as well. Once everyone gets the more information there is in the market, the less market failure there's going to be. So, you know, I guess I'm taking a, a positive view, but um, uh, I think there's still still a long way to go. Um, so I think uh, I think with that, I think it's time to turn to our panelists. And our first panelist is Amy Oster. She's a PwC strategy and partner. Um, she's got extensive experience in financial services and ESG. She had significant roles with, as chief advisor of Commonwealth Treasury Markets Group, and she was a senior executive of ANZ Bank and deputy secretary of Victorian Treasury and an executive director of the, director of the Australian Centre for Financial Studies. And I think um, I think hopefully Amy, Amy, you'll be able to give us a big picture view of this, and and um, I'll hand over to you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, good to see you online. Shame it's not in person. And um, uh, just quickly paying my respects to the traditional owners of the land, certainly that I sit on uh, today, which is the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and uh, recognize we're joining from all lands across Australia. Yeah, I'm going to sort of. I suppose, um, take some of the concepts that were discussed this morning and, um, and, and kind of bring them into uh, a bit of, I think, what's happening in the, in the practice of them. Uh, and I'm coming at this primarily from, I suppose, a, a public interest test or uh, how, is, how is concepts and practice of ESG investment translating into, um, into real world outcomes? So, this is my own little schematic that I sort of drew over the past couple of days to kind of think through um, what Nick was talking about this morning, I think, particularly around time and consistency. Because what I was reflecting on is, is that investment horizons are, are not uniform. Whether you're talking from a, a corporate that's, in, that's um, uh, working to create shareholder value or a government that has a political uh, and electoral cycle. And, uh, and certainly from a fund manager perspective. Um, obviously, we know there's many kinds of funds. So there's you know, hedge funds, alpha funds, uh, right through to active fund managers, and then pension fund managers. And even in the world of pension fund managers, uh, I, I would say um, kind of the investment mandating approach of a defined benefit scheme is quite different to one that has an accumulation account type of um, uh, investment mandate and requirement. So this was sort of my, this is not at all scientific, but it was just kind of a, a, a finger in the air test on um, if you were thinking about the different kinds of funds and their investment styles and approaches and, and therefore portfolio management, where would you put them on a spectrum of their investment horizon and then their, and then their risk reward um, or risk and return appetite? Um, because as, as, as Nick talked about, ESG is kind of far, a, a further investment horizon. Uh, and so I think particularly in the Australian market where you have um, increasing super choice, which is beneficial for consumers, um, there is competition between super funds and there is a need to demonstrate return. Uh, and so um, some of these longer term investment um, risk return trade-offs can become, I think, somewhat more challenging. I suppose the good news, uh, and this is from a, a study that, that the MSCI did, um, the good news is that we are seeing evidence for ESG style investment does impact the cost of capital for companies. So I won't dwell too long on it, but um, it's just a, a kind of a simple chart. It's showing in different jurisdictions that, um, that funds that have uh, kind of a high are rate, rated highly in their ESG approach. Or, or sorry, companies that, that meet those tests um, do tend to have a, a, lower, a, lower, cost of, a lower cost of capital. Um, and that's across all jurisdictions, most uh, demonstrably in the United States, but across all jurisdictions. So we are seeing evidence that it is translating through uh, globally. And here in Australia, next slide. Um, I did this study uh, for a, a, a government um, client recently, 
just looking at to the extent to which um, ESG style investment or more specifically concerns about E energy and climate change, which we talked about a lot this morning, uh, is impacting corporate behavior in Australia. And, and I think we do see evidence of this. So when we look at um, the loan exposure of Australia's four major banks, uh, we have seen a decline in um, exposure to coal mining, um, not in loan exposure to all electricity generation, but a very significant decline in loan exposure to fossil fuel, fossil fuel electricity generation. Uh, and, and it's quite marked actually. Um, so I think we do, we have seen evidence of it here and interesting again to hear um, the, the speakers this morning, such a heavy focus on, uh, on energy, tr the energy transition in Australia. When we talk about ESG in Australia, it's almost always very heavily focused on the E. Um, so we are seeing that, that happening, I think locally here. However, what we are not seeing is the funding of the complete energy transition. And this is where I think we, um, we need to think, or, and, I'll, and I'll get to this later, but uh, I think there's a lot of interesting areas for research here. So we talk about climate change, and I think John made the good point. Um, we could talk about climate change in Australia and what we wanna do about it. Uh, realistically, our impact on the global, on, on, on global temperatures is, um, and, and, and CO2 emissions is, uh, you know, not all that significant considering the, the size of our, the size of the country and the population. Um, and everybody says that it, it's, it's up to Australia to do our part. And so I think that decline in investment in fossil fuel uh, use for electricity generation is, a, for in, in the minds of many, Australia doing its part. What we're finding now is that we're running up against um, this, this problem of transitioning from what was our old grid that was built around fossil fuel generation dominated by those coal mines that are up and down the Eastern seaboard to something that looks very different. And we have um, coal fire generation plants closing faster than expected. So that horizon is coming nearer and nearer. And as we find that that's happening, we don't yet have um, a replacement for dispatchable energy and we don't have a grid that's fit for purpose. So there's a lot of work going on in this area across Queensland, New South Wales and in Victoria about what is the type of funding um, and approach that's required even to transition the grid. Uh, and it's in, it's in the, it's in the multi-billion, tens of billions, um, possibly a hundred billion dollars. And we don't yet see investors from the private sector coming into that space because it's a, it's a long duration problem and it's long duration risk and it's not priced in and nobody really knows exactly how much it's gonna cost and all of those sorts of problems are coming into the frame. Um, I think it just illustrates some of the challenges that, that some of the speakers spoke about this morning. And I just thought I needed to put this up because I do do a lot of work in government. We did, we, the focus this morning um, largely being around uh, uh, fossil fuels, energy generation and climate change. Um, in Australia, we still, being a wealthy country, um, we still have issues with social outcomes. And uh, so those other parts of, of the ESG frame, I, I think are still important here. Um, but at least in the, in the public debate about ESG and funds management, don't tend to get um, necessarily as much, as much attention. So this is where, from my perspective, I think we see um, kind of the frontier on where we might go with ESG. And, and I'm hoping that this leads into, uh, well, I think it will lead into what um, Joanna and Liza might spend quite a bit of time talking about. The initial phases or the early work on ESG style investment focused quite a bit on the left-hand side of the, the, the spectrum um, of this slide. So um, a lot about exclusion-based uh, investing, um, norms-based screening, um, how to improve returns. And there is as evidence that ESG-style investment does improve returns for investors over time. Uh, I think some of the challenges with the exclusion-based or exclusion-style investment, kind of similar to what I was saying about um, 
about excluding fossil fuel generated uh, electricity or fossil fuels generally is that you can exclude, but that doesn't mean that you're investing in the, net, in, in the thing that's actually gonna solve the problem. There's a bit of a, um, uh, there's a bit of a challenge in translating from the negative to the positive. And I think it's, it's kind of encapsulating what Nick was saying um, about regulation and incentive. And some of the challenge I think in regulating in this space is that you're telling fund managers what not to do, but that doesn't necessarily solve the problem. St kind of reducing the availability of capital in certain activities doesn't necessarily translate into the added capital that you might need in order to solve the problem. So you can minimize harm, um, but are you actually doing the next thing, which is taking stewardship? And that's sort of where I think the, the more um, kind of the leading edge is uh, in that notion of taking stewardship and how do you incentivize that? Do you incentivize that? So there's a real nexus for me uh, in thinking about what is the role of the public sector? What is the role of private sector? And where do pension funds sit in that um, on taking stewardship? How much stewardship is, do we expect from pension funds um, from a, 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 a over, over that, over that period of over that period of time, um, I think Nick said um, this is a process, not an event. So I do think it will. I think do think it will um, continue to evolve. But it's a real active question for me. It's kind of like it's kind of like an agent agent problem. Who who is representing the the who is representing the individual and in society here? Uh, almost everybody would be a pension fund holder and a taxpayer. And so which side of the which side of the ledger? Um, are you planning to pay if it costs 20% uh, of your portfolio over time for 1% portfolio manager fee? Is it, are you going to pay more or less in tax if the pension fund allocates its capital in the direction of stewardship? So I just, I think it's, I think it's an interesting question, but some, the, um, some specific examples, I think, in terms of taking stewardship, um, certainly in greenfield um, infrastructure that we really require in this country to move forward, whether you're talking about the electricity grid, where you're talking about electric vehicles and the infrastructure that's needed for that, whether you're talking about um, some of the infrastructure that might be needed for, uh, to ensure that we've got a circular economy going, et cetera, or um, social outcomes and social outcome investing, um, early intervention, say for mental health, um, for ensuring that uh, kids don't in, go into out of home care, um, domestic violence and all of those kinds of support. So a lot of ranges of ideas that, that we could talk about and further explore. I'll stop there now, Mark. Thank you. Um, look, Amy, you raised some really, really big questions and I think um, they're all very good ones and we can return to those in the, in the, in the debate. Um, I'll now uh, hand over to um, Joanna Chong, who's uh, um, from, from APRA. Uh, Joanna is the investment risk specialist there. Um, APRA, for those who don't know, is the Australia's pension fund regulator. Uh, well, they regulate most of the pension funds, not the self-managed funds. Um, she, Joanna regularly speaks at conferences on governance-related issues, including climate-related financial risks. And she's been previously a technical advisor of the House of Representatives Standing Committee on Economics and was previously with Westpac Banking Group. Um, Joanna, you're coming from the corner of the regulators and um, interested to hear what you have to say about this issue. Great, thank you, Mark. Um, we're here to, today just to give uh, the group here just a very quick whirlwind tour of the various uh, initiatives and actions that APRA is taking in the ESG space. Um, firstly, I'll start off with talking about some of the uh, enhancements to the guidance specifically for super funds that we're looking at doing. Then I'll touch on our cross industry guidance on climate change financial risks. And then I will talk briefly about uh, the cross industry climate risk survey that was very recently completed and just finish off with some next steps. So firstly, um, the, in terms of investment risk guidance for our super funds, that's housed in a prudential guidance document with a very catchy name of 530. So uh, SPG 530 was written about nine years ago, so it's well and truly time for an update. And we held an external consultation uh, at the beginning of this year, just in 
in terms of where industry uh, felt that um, 513 needed to be updated. And in the feedback, there was a very strong theme coming back that there was a lot of guidance, uh, a lot more guidance needed on ESG integration. And understandably so, given you know, some of the uh, comments and insights we've received so far today. So in response, APRA is uh, proposing the following enhancements, and this is still subject to further internal development before we take it to industry. We'll be looking to include guidance on the following. So firstly, how trustees can demonstrate a clear understanding of ESG risks as it impacts their fund. So the key APRA key aspect that APRA will look out for here is how ESG risk identification and monitoring processes are integrated into their overall investment governance framework. Secondly, how ESG considerations are to be reflected in the investment strategy, bearing in mind that financial performance criteria will need to continue to be met under the requirements of the sole purpose test as set out in the CIS Act. And thirdly, how material ESG risks are identified and managed uh, by the trustee and the use of appropriate analysis uh, processes. A trustee may also consider the use of specialist ESG systems and resources as other speakers uh, have outlined today. Uh, the other piece of feedback we received was around the linkage between our guidance that we put out on investment governance and this, um, I suppose this climate risk specific cross industry guidance and, and how these two um, artifacts kind of click together. And then certainly we'll be looking to address that point and you know the specific uh, linkage there um, really is in relation to stress testing guidance and, uh, and I had a really uh, you know, excellent presentation on that topic earlier today. Um, and also to clarify that uh, it's APRA's expectations that ESG financial considerations uh, will now extend beyond climate change financial risk, which has been um, the area of focus for the regulator to date. Um, I do have a slide, but I, I think in the interest of time, I, I will not attempt to, to share my screen, but, um, but, but if I paint you a visual picture, uh, this is really a time frame um, for the consultation process relating to SPG 530. So over the next couple of months, we'll be um, you know, continuing our development and engagement on these documents. There's also um, an accompanying uh, practice guide specifically on valuation governance, uh, which I won't touch on today. Uh, we'll be looking to uh, commence our industry consultation around about October of this year. And then all things going well, you know, the, uh, we're currently targeting, um, you know, the updated uh, guidance to come into force around about the middle of next year. Uh, so I just want to spend a little bit of time on the current in force uh, guidance relating to climate change financial risk. So this is the cross industry guide 229. Um, that was released uh, in November, so you know, fairly recent. So what CPG 229 uh, uh, is designed to do is to assist our regulated banks, insurers and super trustees to manage the financial risks of climate change within their existing risk management framework and governance processes. So the objectives of the guide are firstly to provide guidance to boards of our regulated entities on how to better understand the risks and opportunities from climate related factors. And so hence ensure that the investment, lending and underwriting decisions are well informed as to potential climate change impacts. And the guide provides guidance on proportionate governance, risk management and disclosure practices. Uh, so I guess to unpack all that, all um, you know, to, to kind of flesh that out a bit. And I do have another slide, which, I, which I'm um, happy to share during the Q&A if needed. So the specific topic areas there are um, the identification and measurement of risks um, to adequately understand potential business impacts arising from climate risk factors, the monitoring of these risks through the use of regularly updated metrics, so both quantitative and qualitative, uh, scenario analysis and uh, 
certainly as we've discussed today, um, certainly a very valuable way to further understanding the, the long-term climate risks and opportunities that impact our entities. The management of risks through mitigation plans, uh, for example, um, you know, how our entities will engage with stakeholders on these topics. And then there's a section on you know, reporting and disclosure. So it really talks about the key features that should be in ESG reporting for both internal audiences, so board and senior management, through to external stakeholders. Um, now I'd like to um, outline briefly our recent uh, climate risk self-assessment survey that was undertaken during the first half of this year. So that um, survey was completed by 85 entities across uh, banks, insurers and super funds, and there were 29 super funds that took part. And the aim um, of running that survey was to try and get some insights on how our regulated entities are managing climate change financial risk as assessed against CPG 229 and TCFD guidance. And so the key topic areas of the survey, um, uh, governance, risk management, metrics and targets and disclosure. So what are we gonna do uh, with all, all, all this feedback and, and insights? So, so it's a very valuable information source for us in terms of uh, informing our supervisory approach for climate risk management and policy setting going forward. And it really sets the foundation for a longer term regular view of climate risk management practices through the standardized data capture process, which we've now set up. Um, and what I can share in terms of uh, Superfund specific insights. So what uh, is evidence evident coming through in the results is that trustees are taking climate risk issue seriously, which is fantastic to see, and generally aligning well to APRA's guidance um, and superannuation as an industry, you know, does look to be progressing well across all those key areas that were covered by the survey. So I am running close to time. So, um, so just to start to, to wrap up, so just to run through again, some of the, the next steps uh, and, and things for, for this group to keep an eye out for. So again, our SPG 530 consultation uh, happening, uh, we expect in during the last quarter of this year. Uh, you know, we do find you know, feedback and uh, comments from the industry on you know, how we can make this guidance um, you know, relevant and, and Im implementable. Uh, so you know, certainly you know, value and appreciate you know, your contributions uh, there to that process. There will be industry communication on our climate survey results. Um, that's over the next month or so, I understand. And, and that will cover um, all industries, so not just super. And so one point I haven't touched on today, but I think it is worth noting, is the government's consultation on the proposed um, alternative approach for uh, applying the performance test for faith-based super products. So that consultation will run uh, till the 16th of August. So certainly relevant points to consider there in terms of value-based investing. And so with that, I will hand back to Mark. Thank you. Thank you, Joanna. You, you, um... You, you made up some time there, you did extremely well. Um, we, we'll I'm sure there'll be some questions on that and it's sort of, it's, it's coming together. Um, our final uh, panelist is uh, Lisa, Lisa McDonald, who's Head of Responsible Investments at Aware Super, which is one of Australia's largest industry funds, but, and they've got quite a strong and have had for a while a strong focus on ESG investing and in the broadest context. Um, Lisa's got quite a lot of experience in 20 odd, four odd, 25 years of in superannuation and is a, an advocate of uh, responsible investments and sustainable finance. Um, as head of responsible investments and where she is responsible for the development of their, their policies, the execution of the climate change strategies and maintains its ESG policy implementation. Um, she's involved in a number of industry working groups, including the in Investors Against Slavery and Trafficking, ESG Research Australia, the Australian Sustainable Finance Initiative, and Responsible Investments Association. So 
you know, she comes to this with a very much with an industry pension fund perspective. Um, with that, uh, Lisa, I'll hand over to you. Great, thanks, Mark, and hi everyone. I'm going to try and I guess give, um, you know, wrap this session up and it's been a really interesting discussion, I guess, as a, a practitioner in this space for, for quite some time. It's um, it's great to be able to, to talk to industry and to talk to people and, and explain our approach. So um, as Mark said, we're super, we're a $150 billion um, asset owner representing 1.1 million members. Um, they are a diverse range of members um, and putting some things into context, um, we've had member feedback on our clients climate strategy of thank you very much for taking this into account. It's great you're going to give me a retirement savings, but I need a world in which I can retire into as well. So balancing that, how we invest money and, and what the world is going to look like as our members retire versus um, a number of our members or their families being um, workers in the fossil fuel industry and, and that thinking about the transition and the wind down of the fossil fuel industry, um, very much uh, you're, you know, you're putting my family out of a job um, with your climate policy. So sort of setting that context of it is not easy. <laughs> um, and it's, you know, as investors, we're here to deliver long term returns for our members. We think about our organisation and, and our role as delivering um, retirement savings to our members. We also believe, though, as part of that, we can um, consider environmental and social and governance issues in that investment decision making process. So for us, it is very much about um, integrating those ESG issues into our investment decision making process. We will own the market. We've got passive investments. We've got active investments. We're invested in every jurisdiction. We are and we term ourselves a universal owner. So we will own the market. Um, and what is our responsibility as an owner? Uh, so the way we think about it um, is that we um, we have, and to, you know, just to complicate things even more, termed you know sort of a, as a there's a universal owner, there's responsible investment. So we think about ourselves as a responsible owner. When we own an asset, what is our obligation to deliver returns and to drive outcomes and returns from that particular asset? We um, have a, an approach of integration engagement and advocacy um, and exclusions and then measuring impact. So it takes into a lot of the concepts that have been discussed sort of earlier around, you know, um, stewardship, what's the role? Should we be investing in stewardship? I would argue we absolutely should be. And that is the, one of the most important tools as an asset owner that we have to be able to use our um, ownership rights to engage and to vote our shares with the assets that we own. Um, you know, there's a lot of discussion around divestment versus engagement. We also have a duty to ensure we're investing in sustainable industries. If there's long-term stranded asset risk or industries that we just don't believe will deliver long-term returns to our members, we will and our um, trustees will make a decision um, in line with an exclusion framework that we have to think about whether we want to be invested in that industry. Um, I think the evolution of when we, you know, we've always thought about ESG as a risk, it's the opportunity. How do we think about the impacts that our investments can have, but how do we measure that and avoid the greenwashing or rainbow washing, as I like to term it, when we think about the SDGs and all of the different, um, you know, lovely colours we can see in frameworks. But, you know, measuring and, and balancing all of that is very much um, from a trustee perspective, and hope, hopefully this aligns to APRA's expectations as I talk about it, is having, you know, a governance framework in place, in an investment policy, investment beliefs, um, and all of those governance sort of um, uh, frameworks to help us and be able to um, guide through how we think about investing with an ESG lens and what that actually means. Um, you know, I saw in the chat earlier, there was a, you know, should E, S and G be considered um, individually and does one hold more weight than another? They are so interconnected that you cannot think about them in silos and, and climate change is a very good example of that. We see that as one of the largest risks and opportunities that we have that will impact our whole portfolio in a number of different ways, whether it's physical risk, whether it's transition risk and thinking about the workers that are impacted by this. Um, so it's very much then the governance, you know, how are we managing this? So it's really, you know, we, we tend to, some things you can think about individual in a company, some 
some things though, if we want to think about um, stewardship 2.0 is that concept of actually engaging on a, a thematic and, and engaging with regulators, engaging with policymakers to get real outcomes that are actually going to impact real world outcomes and, and be stewards um, of that as well. So, you know, that we, I'm not going to go into what E, S and G individual risks are, there are many of them and they will manifest themselves very differently in different sectors. So we think about sectors and we think about jurisdictions and we think about all of the ESG risks that we actually have. Um, integration for us, we have 80% of our portfolio is with external fund managers. We need to understand um, and do due diligence on the fund managers that we um, appoint and put into the portfolio on what they do. That's one aspect. We do direct investing. So when a direct investment will come across and into the fund in whichever portfolio it may be of fixed income, um, infrastructure or property, there's an ESG due diligence done as part of the investment process. I'm going really quickly sort of through some of the things that we do to just give that flavour of it's not, um, you know, it's not easy, it's complex, but it, it's how we think about it in terms of ensuring that as an investor, we're considering all risks so that, you know, earlier there was a sort of some discussion around, well, you know, um, should fiduciaries or should, you know, this actually be what I mean, asset owners or investors should be doing. You know, if we're thinking about balancing risk and return, it's a risk or it's an opportunity. It's absolutely part of what we should be doing and thinking about. Um, and sometimes I think coining a phrase of ESG has done the snow um, service in terms of giving it something different versus it being an investment risk or opportunity that we need to consider as part of our process. Stewardship is, you know, as I said, um, really, really important. Um, there was some discussion earlier about collaboration absolutely a, a, a collaborative approach to get a consistent outcome on an issue of whether it be diversity modern slavery climate change executive remuneration that the collaborative nature um, and the voice of an you know a lot of you know investors adds weight we've seen that with climate action 100 as a good example in terms of shifting the dial of global investors in terms of getting outcomes so there's a number of initiatives that do exist that we are part of and collaborative collaboration is a key part of what we do as well. Um, advocacy, advocating and, you know, ASFI, the Australia Sustainable Financial Initiative, a great initiative to think about how we can go to government and ask for policy. We've seen the EU put policy and regulation in on this. In Australia, it's actually been driven by the investment community going to government and going, we want, you know, we want policy and regulatory clarity. Um, and we want you to think about how this should be implemented. So it's really important um, as an investor that we think about that. Um, impact and measurement, you know, you can do a whole session just on that in itself. But I think, you know, we've, we've come to a, a view that some, you know, we need to be able to communicate, we can deliver return to our members, but we can also create that positive environmental and societal outcome. How do we do that? What's our framework? How do we measure that? How do we report that? So we spent the last couple of years thinking about that and reporting that to our members and, and, and building on that. Because it is really important to just not go, oh, look, we're meeting all these SDGs, we invest in this, we do that. What is it that we're investing in and how is it doing that? So that transparency and that reporting um, is really important to avoid the green washing and to avoid, you know, the, um, the, the fact that, you know, people are good at kind of, you know, really, you know, there's this whole sort of sentiment around ESG investing is this thing that no one really understands. Well, let's be transparent, let's communicate it. And, you know, we need to get better at doing that as an industry as well. So we've spent a lot of time thinking about how we can communicate um, and what we can do um, on that. It's been a lot of talk on climate change. You know, yes, it is one of the, the largest risks, but it isn't just climate change for us. There's a number of different ESG issues that we'll look at and, and it will come into what the investment is, where it is, what's material. So I really like, and um, Mark, you mentioned it, you know, I, I think we're all sitting here crossing our fingers and hoping that ISSB is going to deliver what we want as an investor and that's that global standard of companies disclosing and putting it into a financial framework of the material ES 
ENS risks that companies have and really disclosing that to us as investors and us as investors holding that up to us and us disclosing that as well. Um, the thought of that on a $150 billion portfolio across, you know, every market and jurisdiction sort of scares me as an investor, but we've got to be able to explain to our members how we are investing their money and what we're doing to be able to deliver those long-term returns. So the more transparent, the more disclosure we can do. Um, I know I'm quickly running out of time. I might just touch on there are challenges okay there, there are a lot of challenges in this um and and we think about those a lot and and, and what we can do but data time frames um how we are going to you know scenario analysis just on climate risk alone in our portfolio is a challenge you know um we you know we're sort of um liaising a lot with APRA, we've done all of your surveys and we're providing lots of feedback and we want to work with the regulators on this to understand what's the impact of doing this on our portfolio. We don't want to be doing all of these things because, you know, there's a, a compliance or some regulations that says you must do this. There must be an outcome that's going to have a material impact to how we're thinking about investing our members' money for the long term and what that means. So, you know, that so what we always go back to. So why are we doing this? We don't want this to be a tick the box exercise. It's about the long-term value creation in the investments that we have and the decisions we make today are going to impact our members, their retirement savings, and they're also going to impact the environment and society. So with that sort of broader lens, having policies, frameworks, disclosure, transparency um, is, is certainly how we're thinking about it and where we're trying to really sort of push the industry as well to, to be able to do that. Unfortunately for everyone, there is no one size fits all and not every asset owner or every investment manager is going to do the same thing. So we've got to get better at, at, um, at disclosing that. So with those comments, and there's a lot in there to sort of um, talk about and go further. So I'm happy to take questions um, and dig deeper into some of that. Um, thanks, Mark. Thank, thank you, Lisa. That was you, you covered a lot of ground, and I, I found myself nodding. Um, look, have we got anyone with a question? Certainly, I think the issue you just touched on, Lisa, and I think all the speakers have both in this session and the previous one is, you know, we've got to try and get market forces working but they in isolation aren't going to work, I think. And, and we, we do still need regulation, but the more we have information, the more people can assess risk and assess performance and understand their investment choices. I think it's just going to drive this to happen naturally. But um, I don't know if anyone wants to comment on that. Um, you know, APRA is saying we need to assess the risk. But to do that, we need the information, we need the models, we need, we need consistent reporting from companies. Thank you, everybody. Um, that's been a really good presentation. Um, we're, we're up to time. I'm, I won't say any more. I'll just hand back to John to close the conference so he, he does it on time and don't get into lots of trouble. John, um, over to you. But thanks, everyone, for the presenters and also the questions. I think it's been a fantastic morning. I, to be honest, I, you just want to keep going, but I can't. OK, thank you. Thanks, Mark. Um, and uh, thanks to the panelists, thanks to the participants in the panel session and the discussions. And thank you to the previous session um, as well. Uh, we had uh, Hazel. So thank you both Hazel and Mark uh, for chairing so ably. I hope everyone's enjoyed today and found it productive and I hope everyone walks away with something that they didn't walk in with. Um, it was about connections. It was about trying to link some of the ESG debate specifically to pension funds and to explore what implications that might be. So the aim was um, the aim is to advance thinking and debate on how to implement ESG more effectively um, in coming years and in coming decades, um, particularly uh, when we think about the very large sums of money assets that we have in superannuation funds in Australia. And I'm, and I hope we've we've moved things a little bit. Um, I'd like to th thank Hazel and Mark. I'd like to thank Andre, Nick, and Warwick. I think uh, they, they provided a, a really a really stimulating uh, start to the day, and also Amy, Joanna, and Lisa, who followed up with some very stimulating and I guess uh, provocative um, provocative um, reactions. Um, this kind of thing just doesn't happen. There are, uh, there's a lot of work behind the scenes. And in this particular case, that was true because we began with live and then we moved to hybrid and then we moved to online. 
And there's an enormous amount of work involved in that. And Silk Advice has just done this so professionally and so terrifically. Uh, so I want to extend uh, our, our joint gratitude to her. As well as that done on you and Sophie Ann who's helped us through the day. And I'd like to thank just generally everyone um, for their time and their input and their feedback to the program. Uh, Mark Hazel, uh, CPR advisory board members like Mike Borsak and Sarah Butler. Um, the UNSW Business School was also involved in this. So the Dean Chris Stiles, Senior Deputy Dean in Research, Frederick Ansel also had an input. Um, the slides uh, and the recordings of the relevant parts of the talk will be uploaded onto our website. Uh, and we'll let you know when that happens. It takes a while because we've got to edit them and, and so forth, but within a few weeks, they'll be up there. So look, thank you again, everybody. Uh, enjoy the rest of the daylight or the night or whatever. Thank you, Andre, for hanging in there until three o'clock in the morning. And uh, with that, I, I, I will sign off. Thank you so much. So long.